Hello, I cannot figure out this camera for the fucking life of me. I'm trying to make it brighter, but every time I make it brighter, the motion of the camera gets very weird. So I think this is about as good as it's gonna get. Findy's crossed. All right, that's good enough. Hello, and welcome back to my da 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 Chanel. I'm trying to make the camera brighter, but every time I make it brighter, the motion of the camera gets thrown off and my pixels per second or whatever the fuck it is. Sorry. Quick outfit tour for those who want it. <laughs> this is my Guinness jumper. I got it in Carol's. Just to let you know, they run absolutely enormous. This is a men's size. They don't have women's sizes, uh, but it says Guinness. They have it in green with white writing and white with green writing. And I can't find my green with white writing when it's somewhere else. So I got this one. Uh, little Peter Pan top that I got from Amazon. These run so big, by the way. This was an extra small men's and I'm fucking swimming in it. And I'm not even an extra small women's. I'm usually a small in women's and this is an extra small men's and it's still quite large. So whatever size you get in women's, do two sizes down for your size in this jumper, I guess. And then I'm wearing a little green beret for Patty's Day. Hopefully you can see that it's fucking green. This thing is annoying the shit out of me. And then I also have my little pint earrings that I got from Groovy Era. I'll link them down below for the pint earrings. They were making them for Patty's Day. Uh, she might still have some. I met her at a market the other day. I was making my jumpers and stuff like that. Doo -doo -doo. I'm learning how to iron knit instead of just iron crochet. So far, it's a higgledy piggledy mess. Hope you guys are having a great day. Let's jump right into it, shall we? My name is Hannah Ruth Savita, AKA the woman in wool. And in 2016, I moved from New York to Dublin and ever since then I have made it my entire personality, that is correct. And on this channel, we crochet or knit and talk Irish history. Why? Because true crime and makeup is oversaturated. But in all honesty, it is because when I moved here, I got a chance to learn uh, in detail all of the great things about this country. And I consider it my job to regurgitate that back to you, fair internet, because such a beautiful and complex country deserves an equally complex channel. And by complex, I do mean technical difficulties. But in all seriousness, I am so enamored with this country and excited to learn its history that I felt it only right to dedicate myself to doing so. Something that I am both interested in and excited to do. Thank you for bearing with me. Follow me here, buy my stuff here, and watch this here. Let's get this show on the road. This is a St. Patrick's Day special, everybody. Now there are a couple times a year when the world looks to Ireland, and the main time is right now, St. Patrick's Day. And as an Irish history-based channel, I felt it only right to dedicate a special to the day. Now I put a poll up on my Instagram asking if you guys would rather have a St. Patrick's Day special on Patty's Day or before, and everybody said before, so hopefully this is up before St. Patrick's Day. Who knows? Organization? I don't know her. Now, what makes it a special? Excellent question. Not only is this video a history of St. Patrick and some stories surrounding him, as is expected, but this will also be a few St. Patrick's Day applicable recipes as well. I also went up to Scary's. I'm gonna show you some of that. We'll talk about it. But in this first part of this video, I will jump into the history of St. Patrick, a bit about him, where he comes from, some of the stories that surround him, why he was so important to Ireland. But at the end of this video, you are, like I said, getting two different St. Patrick's Day applicable recipes to look at, something you can make for yourself, or if you just wanna see me fuck around in the kitchen for a little bit, that's also just an option. Ha <laughs> ha. But I highly recommend trying these recipes because they're not as hard as they seem and they'll make you the star of your St. Patrick's Day show. So it's just something a little different for you. Full warning, the recipes are not traditional Irish recipes. I know a lot of Irish folks in Irish diaspora will be making their brown breads and their stews and everything like that, but these... <laughs> Whew. But these recipes are not traditional. As I said, they're more of an Americanization or a take on different Irish ingredients and making something kind of new and different. One is a Guinness brownie, because why fucking not? And when I tell you these are the best brownies I've ever made, ever. There's a Bailey's icing I make that I made up myself, which when I say I made it myself, it's two ingredients. It's not fancy, but any stretch the imagination. And then the other one is called Green with Envy. The Guinness Brownies recipes come from a blog called Sally's Baking Addiction. Full disclosure, not my recipes, but they are all linked below, so you can take a look at them there. And then the second one is called Green with Envy, and it was from the Jameson Factory. J J distillery? Distillery. They released it during the Pandemic Lovato for at-home consumption during St. Patrick's Day that year, but that's linked below as well. But yeah, these are just fun new recipes that I think will give a different kind of flavor to your St. Patrick's Day. Something different that nobody else will be bringing to the party, you know? Anyway, let's jump into St. Patrick's Day. If you occupy the same spaces online as I do, you'll know that St. Patrick was not from Ireland. If you are not in those same spaces as me and this is the first time you are hearing this, how are you? Are you okay? Did you know that Anne Frank and Martin Luther King Jr. were born in the same year? Also, Picasso died in the 70s? It's gonna be okay. St. Patrick is not just the patron saint of Ireland, he is also the national apostle for Ireland. A national apostle being someone who leaves home and family to spread the word of God's love. These are a bit rarer than just national saints or patron saints because not all saints leave home. Also, I didn't know where to put this, but the Irish people will no doubtedly already be fucking flooding to the comments to let me know. It is Patty's Day, not Patty's Day. 
Okay, are you happy now? Can we move on? Thank you. And now the reason St. Patrick is so synonymous with Ireland is how passionately he spread Christianity and Catholicism across Ireland and how he is credited for making Ireland the predominantly Catholic or Christian country that it was today or that it is today or was in the past. A lot of people are dropping off Christianity at the moment, people my age and younger, but the majority of people in Ireland still do identify as Christian or Catholic. Patrick was born in the year 387 AD and died in 461 AD on March 17th. I had to remember the dates. And yes, St. Patrick's Day is a death day celebration. I think all Saints Days are Death Day celebrations. I couldn't find the answer because every time I Googled are All Saints Day celebrations Death Day or are all of the Saints Days Death Dates or every day, blah, blah, blah. You only get All Saints Day. That's all you get. So I have to find a way to better Google that. Know that All Saints Days may be Death Days, but at least Valentine's Day is as well. St. Valentine died on the 14th of February and St. Patrick died on the 17th of March. And that's why we have those days. A little creepy, but the Catholic Church is a little creepy. Catholic Church is so goth. That's a whole different video. <laughs> but he was born in Roman-occupied Britain. So he was a Roman Briton at the time. Highly considered Roman, but born in Britain. There is some debate as to where exactly he was born. A lot of people think it was Western Britain. It could have been in modern-day Wales, a lot of people think. Uh, a lot of people think it was modern-day England. Some people say it was modern-day Scotland. But the consensus is that he was born in the mainland of Britain, and those delineations of country lines didn't exist at the time. But I'm not entirely sure how to prove where he was born, and I'm sure people will chime in in the comments with different proofs that he was born in different places. But let's move on, shall we? He was born into wealth and relative comfort, and he was born into a church, the church. His father was a deacon and a local official, meaning that he wasn't only just wealthy, he was actually of relative communal significance as well. Like your friend whose mom ran the front desk at school, or somebody who owned like a local teens disco, kind of the same thing. It's actually exactly the same thing. So Patrick grew up pretty comfy cozy, as you can probably imagine, and if left to his own devices, he probably would have followed in his father's footsteps, probably becoming a deacon or a member of the church and a local official as well. From what I have found, St. Patrick actually had a number of siblings as well. Now it's unclear if this was two sisters and six brothers or six sisters and two brothers, but chances are he had a lot of siblings because it was the past. And he had a sister that became a saint as well. Her name was Dererka or Darerka or Dererka. And she became the patroness saint of Valencia Island, which is in the western part most of Kerry. I actually went there one time and I didn't know how to fit that in there. I just wanted to say that. And Dererka had 17 children. Holy shit. And a lot of them would become saints as well. Getting into the family business. Anyway, Patty. But what's interesting is Patrick never actually talked about his siblings or we don't have any firsthand accounts of him talking about his siblings, but all of these accounts of his siblings come from third party accounts after the fact. So we're not entirely sure. But as I get into later, a lot of his siblings may have actually been killed in the raids where Patrick was kidnapped. So let's get into that. When he was 16, raiders from Ireland came to his father's villa in Roman Britain and kidnapped him. And this is where some of his siblings may or may not have been killed. We're not sure, but this is where he was kidnapped and brought back to Ireland, where he was enslaved and spent six years as a herdsman there, like working with sheep and stuff. Which interestingly enough, if you see images of St. Patrick holding like a shepherd's um, rod or like a shepherd's stick with a little curly bit at the end, sometimes they put shamrocks in there. There's different depictions, but a lot of the time St. Patrick has like a shepherd's rod and that is symbolic of his time spent in Ireland as a slave herdsman. So it kind of harkens back to that, which I think is quite interesting because I had never known that until I learned that kind of, I think in school on St. Patrick's Day is like a fun fact. Less fun when you remember what slavery is. But he was there for six years, and when you think about it, six years is a lot, especially when you're 16. That's between the ages of 16 and 22, which is like a huge chunk of time for a young man or young anybody. You go from being a teenager to a young adult, and I can only imagine how angry and scared he must have been in these times. And like being 16 is hard enough, let alone being ripped from your family, some of them being killed, being forced into a new location as a slave. Like it's just so much, especially when your life back home was like super nice and you come here and now you're just serving some guy. And like, I can only feel as a former teenager myself, the amount of resentment I would feel towards all members of the parties that made my life the way it was. Like I would be so mad and resentful towards the whole country, the people who brought me here, the raiders, the people of the country, everybody. I would hate everybody. But Patrick, he turned to his faith as a comfort even more so than he already was. So remember he was born into the church. So he was faithful. He was Christian, but it was during his time of enslavement that he turned towards Christianity and Jesus even more. So the story goes, the legend, the legend goes that six years into his enslavement, he had a dream that there was a boat waiting for him with passage back to Britain, and he decided to follow his dreams. Sometimes I have dreams that people I met in high school take a rubber ducky spaceship to a cafe I once frequented in Port Marnock. But you know, 
We're all different. Sure wish I could get premonitions like Patty. But he did end up going to where his dream told him to go to, and there was a boat with passage back to Britain, and he ended up going back. Now all you have to do if you want to take a boat to Britain is visit irishfairies.com. This video is sponsored. I'm just kidding. But Irish fairies, hit me up, please. Anyway, Patrick makes it back to Britain, but he is not there for long because he has yet another dream. And this dream has a well-known martyr at the time. His name was Victoricus, and he delivered a letter called The Voice of the Irish, which had words of Irish people on it begging him to walk amongst the Irish yet again. Very cinematic. Patrick was very upset by this letter. He actually didn't want to read the whole thing, and he actually didn't think he was up for such a daunting task. Since he was enslaved for so long, he didn't have, in his own words, a sufficient enough education to be able to take on what he thought God was asking him to do. That it wasn't a substantial enough education. And even the day before he went back to Ireland, he actually had huge doubts in whether or not he was able for it. Now, as a 21st century person, I recognize this as imposter syndrome, as do we all, I think. And it's kind of nice to know that everybody struggles with imposter syndrome. And if St. Patrick can be 20 whatever, be called by God to go back to Ireland and do it and become the patron saint of Ireland, then you can start your small business. <laughs> you can start your YouTube channel. You can apply for that job. Do it, dude. Why not? Do the damn thing. You just might become the patron saint of a small island country. Anyway, when he landed back in Ireland, all doubts immediately left him and he started to do his thing. Imagine being kidnapped and enslaved for six years in a country and going back to said country to help the people there. My therapist would be on speed dial. So he starts baptizing and confirming people. So he starts baptizing and confirming people and spreading the good news of God in Ireland, which at that point was a more pagan country with varying worldviews depending on where you are on the island, obviously. It was said that he would bring gifts to leaders and accept no gifts in return, which was the more diplomatic option. But of course, this did not stop him from getting into trouble. At one point, he was kind of captured and tied up, but you know, he got out of it. Oh no, come back. Oh no. Oh my God. <laughs> And this was because he was not liked by certain leaders because if you start telling people that God is the ultimate king, then the actual king is not gonna be too happy about that. But as he continued to work and humble himself before both God and the people of Ireland, he started to gain favor. Now we'll jump into some stories about him, but he did die in Saul from what I could see, which was a place at one point in County Down or Downpatrick at the time, I think it was called, but it's in modern day Northern Ireland. And Saul is still there. They have a lot of St. Patrick themed things so you can go and visit. And that is where his first church was built. He was an interesting man. And while a lot of his stories are very down to earth, very humble, very much um, homegrown Christian kind of man, and a lot of his stories are also very fantastical and nearly unbelievable. And of course, this is kind of the whole point of sainthood, where you have to perform miracles in order to become a saint, and miracles, by definition, are fantastical and somewhat unbelievable. So like, for example, in order to explain the Trinity to people, he was said to pick a shamrock and show it to the people of Ireland, and explained how the three leaves could represent the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, while it is overall one shamrock or share a stem, which is the overall God. And so then the big story there is that people understand finally, and that is how the national flower of Ireland became the shamrock. Now, just to be clear, that is the down-to-earth story. I know that picking a flower doesn't make a miracle, <laughs> but one of his more fantastical stories is when he went to Scaries. And I actually used to live in Scaries, so I went back to my old stomping grounds to get some footage, so let's roll tape. Scaries is a peninsula in Northern County Dublin that is absolutely gorgeous, and a lot of people will recommend Hoth for a seaside village experience, but if you want something less touristy with just a bunch of nice meal options and a toodle around, Scaries should definitely be on your list. Anyway, Scaries Scaries has a few little land masses just offshore from it, and one of them is called St. Patrick's Island after this story. Patrick was living on this island for a short amount of time, and he had with him a goat, which was not only his companion, but a source of milk for him. All right, rock on. And when he was visiting the mainland one day, the people of Scaries hopped onto a boat into the island, so they took a boat to the island, stole his goat, and brought it back to cook it and eat it. Savage. <laughs> and actually, there is still a cafe today called Goat in the Boat in Scaries, and it's actually a really good cafe. When St. Patrick returned to this island, he knew exactly what happened, and he he leapt back to the mainland like with his feet, leaping, jumping from St. Patrick's Island to Red Island, which is not an island, but the shore of the Scaries Harbor. And he left a footprint in the rock at Red Island there because he's super strong and powerful and sickly. And when he got to Scaries, he asked the people what happened to his goat. And the people of Scaries were going to say that they didn't know what he was talking about. He was crazy, totally gaslighting him. <laughs> you sound crazy right now, Patrick. You sound literally insane. Listen to what you're saying. But when they tried to speak, they just ended up bleeding like goats until they were ready to repent and tell the truth and apologize. And then St. Patrick let them talk again. So St. Patrick took away their ability to talk like humans and they could only talk like goats until they were ready to apologize. And now to this day, Scaries still really owns this history with St. Patrick. They have their own St. Patrick's Day parade, kind of a goat heavy theme. A lot of 
other teams and clubs are called the GOATs or GOATs. And if you ask the people of Scaries about this story, they'll happily tell you. It's kind of a fun history and they really lean into it, which is super cool. So if you see anything GOAT themed in Scaries, that's why. And now the alleged footprint of St. Patrick is still there and just like off the side of a bathing station. <laughs> like right next to a bathing platform where you change to jump in the sea, there is a footprint of St. Patrick's allegedly. Man, I love Ireland. <laughs> like, one of the more sacred and uh, religiously significant things that they have, one of a, one of kind of a popular legend. And it's just like off the side, there's like no sign or anything. It's just on Google Maps and you go there and you see it and it's just next to like a bathing station. <laughs> like we have a special rock in America too. And that thing is cordoned off like the Declaration of Independence. No touchy, the Plymouth Rock. St. Patrick's footprint though, has seen your titties when you change to jump into the sea. And of course, another fantastical story that everybody knows about St. Patrick would be the snake story and how he got rid of all of the snakes in Ireland. Now we have to talk about this one a little bit because this story is most likely symbolic as there is no archeological evidence that any snakes were ever in Ireland at any time. <laughs> but the snake story might have been an allegory for other things. Number one could be because the Bible uses snakes as a symbol for the devil or a symbol for evil. So it could be an allegory that St. Patrick got rid of all of the evil or got rid of the devil in Ireland. Or another story, according to a sixth century text called the Dinshanach, Dinshan, Dinshancha, Thank you. There was a sect of paganism called Krom Kruach, whose symbol was in fact the serpent. Krom Kruach was the location of this sect of pagans where they went in County Cavan, and it was a religious site. So they named themselves after the location, from what I know. Now, if you don't want to hear some disturbing things about babies, skip to this time, and uh, I'll see you in a minute. Like, so from what I've heard, this sect was incredibly extremist and bloodthirsty and may have actually unalived babies in order to secure a good harvest <laughs> or sacrificed anything to provide a good harvest. All right, you're good. You're good, we're done now. So when St. Patrick went to this site in order to stop this sect, he came with armed missionaries and lots and lots of people, and there was a battle. And so St. Patrick, of course, won, and he destroyed Krom Kruach, the site itself, not all of the people, and then blessed the Krom Kruach site and made it like a holy site. And now the pagan survivors of this siege were scared of what the pagan gods would do when they could no longer do what they needed to do to secure a good harvest, you know what I'm talking about? And so they were very, very frightened of what the backlash from their pagan gods would be. But when nothing bad happened, it almost kind of reinforced the idea that St. Patrick was right and on the right side and that Christianity was going to be the path moving forward. So the idea that St. Patrick removed all the snakes from Ireland could have been about this very specific pagan sect as well, or it could have been about paganism at large. Repelling the snakes out of Ireland could have been repelling the pagans out of Ireland, either by conversion or different unaliving methods. So that wraps up the history part for this video, and I know that that was a very brief history, but hey, it wouldn't be a special if we didn't do something a little different, am I right? We still gotta show you the Guinness brownies and the cocktail. I still have to film the cocktail, oh oh. <laughs> and even though there are so many stories about St. Patrick and there's so many different topics I could have covered in this kind of St. Patrick's Day special, I do wanna leave time for some more fun stuff as well. Like I think for my next St. Patrick's Day specials for the next couple years, hopefully, like I could do a history of the St. Patrick's Day parade because the St. Patrick's Day parade was actually started by Irish diaspora in America and not here in Ireland. Or I could do a St. Patrick's church tour because there are a lot of St. Patrick's churches. But for now, relax, sit back, enjoy the pandemonium that is me baking and making a cocktail and just enjoy that, enjoy that ride. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think I figured it out. More complicated than it needed to be. I'm new at this whole expensive camera thing. I got like a really nice camera and I don't know how to use it. It's like giving a monkey an iPad. Re literally. Right? Okay, so hello. Probably already heard the intro. Intro Hannah would have covered that. Thanks, Intro Hannah. You're doing great. So I was going to go to Scary's today to film the St. Patrick's footprint, and I'll probably go another day, but I woke up this morning and it was snowing. So happy first day of spring. It's March 1st and it's snowing. But I'll throw some footage in here now of the dog because Odie absolutely loves the snow. He's experienced the snow exactly one other time, and that one time he absolutely freaking enjoyed it. So this time when I woke up and I saw the snow, I was scheduled to go on the 9:10 train up to Scary. So I was like, I woke up at like half seven. I'm like, wash my, f I'm like good to go. Didn't see anything, didn't see any snow. And then I finally woke up to come to, I was going to bring the dog to Scary's. And then I was like, oh wait. And I looked outside and it was covered in snow. So I was like, okay, I can't bring the dog to Scary's because one, I'm not going to trust the trains in the snow right now. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it. We're not going to scary state. Also, I was going to bring the dog to scary's and it's just too cold to bring the dog to scary's all day. It would have been like a four or five hour affair. He would have been freezing his little paws a bit and he hates wearing jumpers and shoes. We have little jumpers and shoes for him, but every time he puts them on, it's like, he's the saddest thing in the whole world. Right, buddy? 
yeah, you want to be on camera so bad. He was asleep before, and now he's like, pick me up. Come here. He's decided against it. But uh, I brought him out in the snow because I was like, oh, shit. he loves the snow, though. So I brought him out in the snow for a good 10, 15 minutes before he started to, like, do the chihuahua shake and, like, look at me like... So I took him out and I decided, you know, never mind. Like, I'll, uh, I'll just do the baking stuff today now that it's snowing. I'll stay inside. I'll do a little bit more filming here and then I'll do scaries another day. So that was a long winded answer of welcome to my brand new cooking show. Now, being from America, I have a certain affinity for sweets. Here, come here, bud. Oh, microphone, microphone. That's better. Hold on. All right, this is how he likes to be held. This is his favorite thing. So welcome to my brand new cooking show. I have an affinity for sweets and for baked goods. We love a good baked good. And so when I came over here, there are sweets, there are baked goods. They're not as sweet as the States. So my palate has changed. I don't love all the sickly sweet stuff that I used to anymore. And if I do have that stuff, it's in way smaller quantities now. And actually I used to, I told my partner this, I used to, uh, in the morning, I used to be a kindergarten teacher and I used to wake up every day and get like one of those 32 ounces of flavored coffee with like all the sugar syrup in it and a donut every morning. <laughs> that was kind of my thing. I loved sweets. Oh, I just, I was, I ran on sugar and like, but like nobody ever called me out on my eating habits. Ever because there was no like physical manifestation. Also, I was like 22. Eating unhealthy at 22 is just par for the course. So uh, when I came over to Ireland and you know, things changed, my diet changed, my palate definitely changed. But when I found these, these brownies are un- real. They're not super sickly sweet, but they kind of have this like American flavor. You know what I mean? Like they, they definitely Americanize something. So what it is, it's a Guinness brownie. So it involves Guinness, which, you know, obviously Irish and like cooking with Guinness, obviously Irish and, you know, an Irish flavor kind of thing. But obviously an American got a hold of it and was like, I know exactly what to do. It's, it's a brownie made with, it's just unreal. And what I've done is I've a few changes to the recipes. I usually double it and then use a bigger pan than what the recipe says. I will link the recipe down below, but I'll give my little insights here and there. So know that I double the recipe and I cook it in a pan that's twice as big. When I first saw the recipe, I didn't have a small pan. I only had a big pan, but I only had a big pan. And so I decided to double the recipe. This camera continues to like adjust. Apologies guys, probably looks fucking insane, but I double the recipe and then I don't do the frosting on the top, the Guinness frosting. This this person, I think it's Sally's Baking Addiction, she uses a Guinness frosting and I make a Bailey's icing. So you're about to watch an American who's been living in Ireland make a Guinness brownie with Bailey's icing. And I dearly apologize to the people of Ireland, but I'm also not that sorry about it because it's absolutely unreal. And if you make this, you will be the favorite person at the party. I promise. So get ready to watch me flounder about in the kitchen for a little bit. This is my real kitchen. So the lighting is a bit weird. I'm trying to figure that out. What else? You're welcome for this recipe. So and that being said, the first thing we do with this recipe is boil a bunch of Guinness. I know it seems like a sacrilege, but it's only the canned Guinness. So don't, don't worry too much about it. And so the first thing we need is one 12 ounce bottle of Guinness, but I have cans left over from Christmas. They say you can use espresso powder as well. I don't, I don't use the espresso powder. One, cause I don't usually have espresso powder. My coffee order is a white Americano like myself. Anyway, let's go get the cans from outside <laughs> cause they're on the patio. Where else would they be? All right, got them. Now these are not 12 ounces. These are 500 mils. I don't know what that is in ounces. The more I try to grasp conversions, the more I lose my mind. Also, just a quick outfit tour. I made this skirt. I made this. It's a bit shit, but you know, I think it's cute. And then I'm wearing my orange jumper in celebration of St. Patrick's Day. I'm just wearing a black shirt. I'm wearing my knockoff Princess Diana earrings because I like them in my ring. I'm also wearing this necklace that I got myself. It's in the shape of Ireland and it has a little diamond on Dublin. And I got myself this when I got my citizenship. And then I'm also wearing, I don't know if you can see it, a gift shop Carol's tat hair clip thing. But we're going all out for Patty's day. Also my kitchen is green. That's not for St. Patrick's day. I'm not that woman who repaints her kitchen every holiday. So let's get started on this. What we have to do first, drag the camera. What we have to do first is boil a couple of cans of Guinness into like kind of a syrup. It's gonna boil it down. It's gonna reduce that Guinness. So we got our pot and we're gonna preheat the oven. 177. Again, with the conversions, 350 or 177. So we're at 180. I do apologize to all the Irish people in advance. Just gonna pour it into this pot. Sorry. Wooden spoon, give it a stir. Get all the head off of it and bring that to boil. And that's the first thing you're gonna do. It's gonna boil it down. I'll just pop back when it's boiled down because that's the first step because you have to let that cool. So I like to do that first and then just leave the rest of the steps until after. So preheat the oven, 
Boil the Guinness. Again, sacrilege at first, but you will thank me after. You're gonna thank me after, okay? Trust the process. All right, first big news of the day. I did let it over boil. I'm also making myself some lunch while I'm here. There's a lot going on. This is chaos. Here for the real riveting content and stuff, but this is what it looks like. It actually smells really, really nice. I'm making myself some lunch as well, so ignore that, but this is the boiling Guinness. It smells really good, actually. Trust the process. Okay, so the Guinness is boiled. We've got a little trivet here. Leave that to the side. This has to cool for 10 minutes. It says to cool for 10 minutes. It's probably gonna cool for a little bit longer. So let's go get everything else we need and I'm gonna bring it over here to this table. <laughs> it's kind of reduced to about half the size. I'll show you. So it's about half full, this pot, right? It's also covered in Guinness residue. All right, we've got our stuff here. Now, I have to remember I am doubling the recipe because I have a big pan and that's the way it turned out the best last time. So this is gonna be double the amount that you can use if you have a small pan. Three quarter cups or 170 grams of unsalted butter. 170 times two is 340, right? 17 plus 17 is 34. So 340 grams of unsalted butter. I only have, I have mixed amounts of butter. Hello? 165. We're, it's going well so far. That's nearly perfect. It's a little less than what we need, but we should be good. Fingies crossed for me. So what I have to do is I have to microwave this with the chocolate that's going in there. Honk. Honk. I'll cut that up into little squares. It just melts better. You cut the butter up into little chunks, then you cut the chocolate up into little chunks. Two four ounce bars, so two hundred twenty-six. Two hundred twenty-six times two is roughly times two is roughly four hundred and fifty grams of semi-sweet of semi-sweet chocolate. So I have chocolate. Can you please chill the fuck out? Four hundred and fifty. Oh my god, this fucking thing. You ever have a piece of old equipment? And you're just like, I won't replace it ever. <laughs> Alrighty, that's not helpful at all. 204. Okay, perfect. Keep going. Now I'm gonna chop these up and microwave it. And by chop, I mean break, I suppose. Let <laughs> me grab a knife. If you expected a soothing cooking show, I'm very, very sorry. This is chaos incarnate. It's real life and it's gonna be great. It will make your St. Patrick. It'll be the star of the fucking show. I, I'm hoping to guarantee it. So I'm just gonna cut up the butter really quick, just into like heavy chunks, essentially. I just want it to be able to melt a little faster. <laughs> I feel like a beauty YouTuber. <laughs> Roughly the size of a chunk of butter. I don't know. Bop, bop, bop. The thing about cooking is, and baking especially, especially if you're baking with kids, I find, you just gotta be okay with getting a little sticky and gross. Cooking with children especially, the point is not to like bake. <laughs> I've cooked with kids quite a bit. In my time, I used to be a kindergarten teacher. I've cooked with my god kids several times and baked and stuff like that. And it's not about the baking. It's not about getting cookies at the end or brownies or whatever you're making. It's not about that. It's about the process. So like, I find when you're baking by yourself, the intention is the outcome, right? Like, what is it gonna be? How is it gonna taste? The actual quality of what you're making. But when you're baking with kids, it doesn't matter. It, it just matters that you're having fun and you're spending time together and that they're learning a little bit, like learning to measure, learning to be safe in the kitchen, learning to make something like making things when you're a kid and making things is so important you know like making anything you could be drawing a picture you could be making brownies or attempting to make brownies god damn why is this so hard I promise I'm a decent baker this is usually what my baking process looks like real life baby oh my god did I break off a piece of the knife you guys I broke my fucking knife oh my god where is this fucking metal bit uh-oh um, well, hopefully there's no fucking pieces, tiny pieces of metal in this brownie. Is it in here? Or did it break earlier? Fingers crossed, right? Aw, oh, the chaos ensues. I really did intend for this to be a little more aesthetic. I do apologize. <laughs> you know what I'll do? I'll sift it so this way no, um, no little metal bits go in there. All right, so we're gonna microwave this at 30 second intervals so that it gets nice and evenly hot and it's just gonna be like a hot liquid when we take it out. And we're gonna start with a brownie mix with this. I'm gonna stick on an apron real quick. All right, now that our chocolate and butter is all melted together, we can get to the good stuff. So it's just a thick, smooth liquid at this point, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab a bigger bowl because I need a bigger bowl because I'm doubling the recipe. I don't know if I said that enough. Stick this in, pour this 
into there. Blech. Delicious. I would drink this with a straw, it's, and it smells amazing. It smells like, I don't know if, my mom loved to bake, right? She was a very good baker. She is a very good baker. My mom's alive, sorry. Um, she is a very good baker, and I loved joining her in that. Like, baking with my mom is a very important like core memory for me. So like baking with my mom has always been a really great time. And this smell of like chocolate and butter melting together reminds me a little bit of baking with my mom. Cause I was always allowed to use the microwave. <laughs> Cause like, you know, when you're a kid and your mom's like trying to actually make something, you're like, I want to help. She's like, okay, fine. You can, um, you can microwave the butter and the chocolate together. And I was like, yay, this is a mess. All right, cool. I love wearing an apron cause I can just do one of the these. What's next? After you boiled some Guinness, melted some butter and chocolate together, whisk in sugar and a half cup of the reduced Guinness until completely combined. How much sugar? How much Guinness? One and a quarter cups of granulated sugar, so I'm gonna need two and a half cups sugar. I forgot how much fucking shit there goes into doubling a recipe. The good part about doubling a recipe and living in the city is that you can give some to your neighbors. I've been on kind of a trading journey with my neighbors recently where um, we've been trading food back and forth. So my neighbors are from Nigeria, which actually has a lot in common with Ireland. The patron saint of Nigeria is also St. Patrick's. So coming up is their big holiday as well. So they're about to have a really important day, I think. So I think Guinness brownies would be great. Nigeria is actually the only country in the world other than Ireland that produces Guinness so far. I think they're thinking of opening a Guinness. I think they're thinking of opening a Guinness plant like in London. Oh, hello, Bubby. Hello. But there is none yet. The only other place that makes Guinness except for St. James's Gate in Dublin is Nigeria. Sorry, I know my forehead keeps getting cut off. I'm trying to like show you what I'm doing and be in the shot at the same time and it's quite difficult. So yeah, that's what we're doing. So I can give some to my neighbor. They've been getting me jello fries. <laughs> They've been giving me jello fries and I've been baking for them in return because I'm not as good of a cook as them. All right, so two and a half cups of sugar. So that means we need five, five of these. So five of these bit boys, look how cute. I got these in Walmart last year. And thank you, they're from a cottage court collection. I love them. This is gonna take forever. The chaos continues. One, five, two and a half cups of sugar. And then it says to put half of the cup of the reduced Guinness into this. So that means one cup of the reduced Guinness. So it's a, it is a liquid. It's a bit of a thicker liquid than Guinness because it's reduced, but it's, um, it's still roughly the same kind of consistency as Guinness, even though it has been reduced. It's nice and cooled now because I left it for a good while while I was microwaving the chocolate. You can reduce the Guinness before you do anything else. So like this is a long process to make Guinness brownies, obviously, but like, like I said, well worth it. Pour one cup of Guinness into here. Beautiful. This one has a little cow on it. <laughs> Ooh, this is lickety. <laughs> Gotta go a little slower first and then you can really start to whip it. Hey, this part takes a minute. What's the next bit while I'm stirring this? All right, eggs and vanilla extract. So it says three eggs, so I'm gonna need six eggs. Jesus. This is very liquidy at the moment and it will continue to stay liquidy. Don't be afraid of the liquid. Again, the phrasing. It doesn't look great, but it smells unreal. I keep licking my fingers. Hopefully that gets baked off. I don't know. Home baking is the best thing. Just six eggs. Jesus Christ. All right, one, six. I need a way bigger bowl. Break of the yolks, break of the yolks. It's important that you let things cool as well, like the Guinness cool, because if it's too hot when it goes into the brownie mix, it'll cook the eggs, and then you just have little bits of egg. Something I learned the hard way. Very thick battery, kind of. Alrighty. That. One teaspoon vanilla extract, so I'm doing two. I don't have a teaspoon measure, so I feel that shit with my heart, you know what I mean? I'm... Sure. Vanilla and garlic, they are based on vibes only. I do not measure vanilla and garlic. I know I should. Sue me. <laughs> I kind of cook like your grandma would cook when you ask her like, well, how do you know, like how long do you bake it for? And she goes, until it's done. That's me. That's how I crochet as well. They're like, do you have a pattern for this? And I'm like, not really. One cup of all-purpose flour. So two cups of flour. I don't know if two cups of anything is gonna fit in here. One, four. I'm gonna mix this all together, probably with a wooden spoon at this point, cause, oh, and I need salt. A dash, perfect. I'm gonna mix this all together, probably need a wooden spoon at this point, pray for me. It's still gonna be really thick and liquidy. It's a brownie batter and there's a cup of Guinness in it, but it should come together a little bit better. I've made these a couple times. The first time I made them was the best time. They're good all, every time, but the first time I made them, they were like super fudgy and stuff like that. They were me and my partner's first thing we made together years ago. And I think that's what made him fall in love with me. And he's Irish, right? So he should know good Guinness based recipes. <laughs> if your family gives you too hard of a time for boiling the Guinness, just tell you an American, tell them an American made you do it. Let them 
comment on this video for interactions. Also, comment below what you're doing for Patty's Day. I, in my experience, I've been here seven years now. The first year I came, obviously I went to the parade in Dublin. I was like super excited. I was like, let's do it, let's go. I went, I sat in gay spar there and watched the parade go by for like an hour and then took twice as long to get home. <laughs> it was fun, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. Then the second year, I don't think I did anything. I think I stayed in like my local parade. So I was living over in Clondalkin at that time, which is delightful if you haven't been to Clondalkin, definitely. I'm not living there now, but I do like Clondalkin quite a lot. I still go back there every so often because um, my godkids live there and that kind of thing. And then the, like the third year, I know I definitely tried to go to the parade because my goddaughter was in the parade and I was like, oh, I'm gonna go see her. I couldn't see a goddamn thing. Couldn't see anyone or anything. I stood there in the parade. I tried to get a look out. I was over by Trinity on top of Dame Street. And I tell you, there were people standing on the Lewis ticket machine, like standing on the ticket machine, illegal, by the way, I assume, trying to get a, and like, it was insane. So I was like, you know what? I got myself a shamrock shake and I went back up to where I was living. I was living up in Scaries at the time. Ever since then, I've just kind of stuck it out at home. And I think a lot of people from Dublin will do the same. There's a lot of great parades though. Like I've never been to like any of the other parades around Ireland, like Galway or Cork or anything like that. I haven't done those. I'd say I'd like to at some point, but honestly, um, the older I get, the less I like crowds. <laughs> and actually one year my grandma did come for St. Patrick's Day and we went to the parade together. She's originally from Germany. So we went to the parade together there and that was quite fun. <laughs> she was like well confused. She was like, why is everyone dressed like hookers? And I was like, okay, Oma. <laughs> Let's get a pan. We're gonna grease the pan and pop these in or I'll show you what I'm doing. So this is a big rectangular pan. The recipe calls for a smaller um, like nine inch pan, but I didn't have that when I made these for the first time. So I'm just trying to recreate what I did for the first time. So I'm sticking some parchment paper in there just to keep it from sticking. And I'm just gonna pour the batter in. Is that a good sound? You like that? All right, that's as good as it's gonna get. So I'm just gonna start pouring thoughts and prayers. Merrily we roll along. Okay, we're already here. There we go. There we go. Pour that sucker in there. Come on, man. Work with me here. This is full. <laughs> now, the first time I made this, I stuck chocolate chips in there. I'm not gonna do that this time. I don't think it needs it. Turns out pretty fudgy anyway. My dog is currently begging for a lick of this and obviously, can't have anybody. Okay. Now I'm gonna stick this in the oven. It's been preheating at 177 or 350 for the last good while. And the recipe tells you how long to stick it in for. This is doubled, like I said, so I'm gonna play it by ear. <laughs> Had to wash our hands and wait. So a little kind of all over the place, but a lot of brownie, I'm gonna let it settle, it's gonna be good. Okay, so the brownies are done, they're nice and cool. I had to change, apologies. But now I'm gonna show you how to make the Bailey's icing and this is my own creation and it's very easy. It's like the easiest thing you'll ever make and you're gonna put it on every cake that you've ever had now. So take a look. First things first, Bailey's. Second thing second, powdered sugar or icing sugar. Bailey's. You can use Bailey's or you could use some sort of fake knockoff Bailey's. I call it Faley's, like faux Bailey's. Bailey's or Faley's works, whatever you want to do. Honestly, much like your grandma does, like I said, I don't measure or weigh anything with this. I just kind of feel it and I know the consistency that I'm looking for. Second is icing sugar. I only have a little bit left, so I'm only gonna do one and I'll show you what it is. But my suggestion is that you make this icing and you bring it with you wherever you're bringing the brownies instead of putting it on the brownies right away because it sometimes has the tendency to either crust over or to seep into the brownies. So wherever you're bringing the brownies, bring them and then bring the icing as well in like a little Ziploc baggie or a container and then pour it on before you serve it and it's amazing. All right, I think the experts call this a coffee nook because there's a lot of shit in there. Oh, perfect. I only have a little bit of icing sugar so I'm just gonna pour that all right into there. Oh, geez, I do not have a lot. So that's a really tiny bit. You're gonna need a lot more than this because the littlest bit of liquid will melt down a grand amount of fucking icing sugar. Then I'm gonna take the Baileys. Like I said, I only need a tiny bit because I only have a tiny bit of icing sugar but I'm just gonna literally like there we go, a sploosh. And as you mix it, it will all come together as you do it. It's gonna look a bit brown because Bailey's is a bit brown, that's okay. So you just keep mixing it. It's gonna look a little lumpy and weird at first. See, looks a bit lumpy and dry. And just keep mixing, mixing, mixing. I might put just a splash more. So it looks kind of like a glue, if that makes sense. Looks kind of bloopy, kind of liquidy, but not quite. I do literally the tiniest bit. I'll pour it into the cap first so I don't over pour. And there you have it. Bailey's icing. Easy peasy. Let's get a brownie. Oh yeah. This is a bit cakey than what I'm used to. I was, I'm used to it being a little bit fudgier, but 
so fucking good. Let's get this bad boy plated. Ready, we have a brownie. Label out. <laughs> Take this all over the brownie. If you're not into super sweet stuff, you might not even need the icing. Brownie will be good enough for you. Look at that, like a movie set or like a commercial. Goodness brownie, Bailey's icing. Every time. Still a little bit warm. It's so fucking good. St. Patrick's Day. This is your new recipe. There's no, oh, it's soft. It's squidgy. It's a little cakey on the edges, but it's fudger in the middle. And the Bailey's icing just gives a little hit, probably just for the adults. You can put like any kind of frosting or chocolate that you want to on top of it, obviously. Mm, shit. <laughs> if you've got Bailey's and a can of Guinness, you can make these. Using your Irish stuff for St. Patrick's Day, great idea. <laughs> but if you want a St. Patrick's Day recipe that's Irish, that's a little bit more sweet, more fun, that isn't a traditional recipe, but is a fun thing to do, this is a great idea. If you have kids, this is also a good idea since the Guinness is cooked off, you don't need to worry about the alcohol. Unless you're making the icing. Don't make the icing for the kids. But holy shit. Mm. I wish I could, like, it smells good, it looks good. I brought these to work a couple times over the course of my life, I guess, like, and every time they're gone. By the end of the day, they are gone. Somebody eats all of them, they bring them home to their, like, loved ones. This is your new thing that you're doing. I've decided it. I don't know, who am I? Don't listen to me. I'm just a girl on the internet. You don't know me anything. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Guinness brownies, Bailey's icing. And now I should be telling you about a cocktail that I learned about as well. This way you can celebrate St. Patrick's Day in your house with style. And you don't need to go out if you don't want to. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. I'm going to show you a cocktail probably now. But yeah, so enjoy. I'm going to eat this. In a never-ending quest to figure out the camera, I think I figured it out. I'm going to take some cinematic shots of the ingredients we've got. And the recipe is, of course, down below. You could just follow that, but that's not as fun, is it? So we have got some very cool stuff here. I put the knitting in the background for the vibes. Honestly, what do you think? We also have Prosecco, which is chilling in the fridge right now. We've got basil. We've got lemon juice. We've got Jamie. We've got a shaker. We also have ice. And then we're going to need simple syrup, which is very easy to make, but you can buy some at the store. I'll explain it now. Hmm, okay, let's rock and roll. This is reminding me of my pumpkin carving video a little bit. <laughs> okay, so let's get to making this cocktail. I have already made simple syrup. I have this in my house normally. So I've already made simple syrup, but it's actually super simple to make. And if you're not comfortable making it, I think a lot of places will sell it like coffee shops and stuff like that. It's two parts sugar and one part water brought to a boil until it all dissolves in. And then you just bring it to a cool and you can save it forever. So I usually fill a jar. It's not usually always filled. It's usually about half full, but there's not a lot in it right now, but that's okay. We have enough for this cocktail. The recipe says to muddle a basil leaf in the shaker. And I am saying basil because the Irish people make fun of me, but if I say basil, the Irish people make fun of me, but if I say basil, then the Americans make fun of me, so. Okay, so stick one basil or basil leaf fresh in there. I already have a muddler because I got really into cocktails during the pandemic Lovato because uh, I like cocktails and I like going to like nice places and ordering them. Uh, who doesn't, Hannah? One of my hobbies includes drinking nice things. That's not a real hobby. So we got really into them in the pandemic and um, just found this cocktail on the Jameson website. So I ended up getting like a muddler and a couple shakers and all that fun stuff. And muddling, what it just means, it just means smushing. Why don't they just say smushing? It just means smushing. So you smush it. Basil is so underrated. <laughs> this smells like an Italian summer's day. So we smushed a basil leaf. Yeah, we muddled the fuck out of that. And then add all of the ingredients except for the Prosecco into the shaker. Don't shake the Prosecco, it's bad news. So what we want is 45 mils of Jameson. Whoop, hello. So I'm going to take this as being 30 mils. It might not be, this is chaos again. I'm sorry, it's the brownies all over the place. Jamie, sponsor me. So we, I'm gonna do this as being 30. So one, and then I need a half of one of this. This is gonna be very strong, you guys, because it's topped off with Prosecco. What day is it? Yeah, we're good. I don't have work tomorrow. Okay, so 30 mils of lemon juice. Somebody, for somebody who makes their own sugar syrup, I don't make my own lemon juice. I don't juice lemons in my spare time. Who does that? All right, so that's 30 mils lemon and then ice, 30 mils of simple syrup. Oh no! Just poured simple syrup all over my <laughs> fucking thing. All right, let's get some ice and start shaking. Okay, so, cause I'm not a real bartender, I don't, I'm not super comfort, like confident, comfort, I'm not super, I'm not super confident shaking without spilling everywhere. So what I do is, and also because I have, um, smaller hands than most people, that's not like a pick me thing. I just genuinely have fairly small hands. I'm a fairly small person in real life. I like to, uh, wrap a dish towel around my shaker so that nothing comes flying off and wet. And I'll show you. There's a little life hack out there for my small handed royalty kings queens whoever you tighten like that this way everything kind of safe then you hold on to it like this like a regular bartender would with the cup and the top and you just shake careful with this sounds 
Yeah, see, this is already wet. Maybe it's because the shaker is not the best. I have two, this one's the shittier one. Now, I have an actual Jameson glass. That would make most sense, but I also, really like this mule glass that my grandmother gave me. So I'm gonna pop my ice in there, fuck it. And then you take this, oh, I need a strainer. One second. Because we have basil leaves in here, they could get through the more open strainer at the top. So if you take the lid off, there's like a pretty wide strain in here with lots of big holes that basil could get through. So I'm getting a little tea strainer as well. Pop that through. Because of the basil, it gets a little bit of a green tint to it. If you wanna add more basil, I usually try to add more basil, but I just stuck to the recipe this time, which is why it's called Green with Envy. And then you just top it off with Prosecco. <laughs> Did not pre-open this, let's see. The fuck, little? Oh, there we go. All right, it's gonna pop, no. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I thought that was gonna pop. I was gonna get real scared for a second, but then you just top it off with Prosecco. Oh yeah, and that is that. And this is absolutely delicious. It's sweet, it's kind of got that basil -y savoriness to it. It's really like a very complex drink. I don't know how to say, I'm not very like, I'm not a foodie, I don't do the, the words. Full-bodied aroma, something, something. No, it's just as good as I remember it. If you wanted to a little less Prosecco than what I did, that would make more sense. If you're a little bit more of like a whiskey heavy person, you can toot a little about the way you want to. I might add more basil and whiskey in my next one, less Prosecco, but honestly, it's a fucking, good ass drink, you know what I mean? Jameson sponsored me. But yeah, you can serve it in any kind of glass you want to. Nothing fancy, it's Patty's day, fuck it. Oh man, that's gonna go down a little too easy. This is a lot of Prosecco. I should have put less Prosecco in it. I think it's just supposed to be like another shot of Prosecco. I like emptied a bottle into there. Mm. Enjoy your cocktails, enjoy your Guinness brownies. Back to intro outro Hannah in the same outfit. Now, I do love the stories of St. Patrick, but I think I love the globalization of St. Patrick and St. Patrick's Day even more. And I'm gonna read this part because I think it's important. The Irish for generations struggle to be thought of as anything else other than dirty peasants ruining the world by moving all over it. Just by being Irish and being in the world, people thought the property value would decrease. But since it grew in its independence and reclaimed the culture that was so heavily squashed by its oppressor, the true light of Ireland started to come alive globally. By the time Ireland had started to clean off its emerald and dust off its tweed, there were millions of Irish diaspora starting to look in its direction, starting to figure out what it actually meant to be Irish outside of being a colony. And suddenly a sense of pride started emerging from Irish diaspora and Irish people. A sense of what it actually means to be Irish and be proud of it and no longer ashamed started to take place. In a burst of new pride, St. Patrick's Day started to take shape. And while people in Ireland usually took this day as a pious remembrance of their patron saint, Irish Americans started to realize they should be loud and proud about their Irish ancestry and no longer willing to hide it and try and fit in just to get jobs. Those days were over and it was time to celebrate who they really were. And what better way to celebrate that than a party on the patron saint's day. The first St. Patrick's Day parades were in America and it soon spread all over the world. And of course, now Ireland is at its epicenter. And if you go to the parade this year, remember where it started as a new celebration of an emerging pride in something that used to be so shameful and a celebration of Ireland itself. And remember the fantastical stories of St. Patrick, the journey Irish people have been on in the public eye and in their private homes the leaps and bounds Irish have taken to create a new image for themselves in the world and a different self image in their own country. The changes, the votes, the sacrifice, and the love they've had to put in in order to become who they are and the generations that made it happen. And honestly, the idea that these stereotypes and false images of large groups of people can change. It builds hope for oppressed groups now and the potential future that they might face. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Haha. <laughs> Five. I was trying to do that for the camera. Pick me up, Food Network, which means my partner can lick the bowl. Hooray. Not you, Odie. You're not that one. Time to wash our hands. <coughs> this fucking belt never stays. Sorry about that. It's just being held, looking out the window. I'd kiss you, but I get lipstick on you. Okay, wow, not better at all. Does that make more sense? Sure.